All right, switching gears a little bit. Let's talk about management techniques because that, that's uh, what I know based on questions a lot of you are here to discuss. Uh, so we have several different options, whether we're talking lethal, non-lethal, uh, but under lethal uh, control methods, trapping and shooting are big ones. Uh, steel hunting, again, is a big one in South Carolina. Uh, dogging hogs is a big one in South Carolina. Toxicants, I'm gonna spend some time talking about each one of those, but hopefully in the near future, toxicants are gonna be an option for us. Um, non-lethal techniques, you know, if y'all have ever been to one of my trainings, you have heard me preach on exclusion time and time again, and I got bad news for you, I'm gonna preach on it again tonight because it works. Uh, but there's behavior modification we can do. Repellents is kind of hit or miss, you know, I, I've heard it both ways. I've put some in test with some results, nothing that was really worth writing home about. Um, habitat modifications, I've seen some pretty big improvements from habitat modifications. Uh, and then integrated pest management. So the most effective hog programs, and I'm sure most of you that are trying to manage pigs are already doing this, but integrated pest management is when we're combining more than one of these techniques. So we're combining trapping and shooting and dogging uh, along with exclusion on our ag fields uh, and some habitat modifications in some of our major problem areas. Uh, so combining multiple techniques is gonna give us the best results. Um, and any of you that are doing that, y'all have seen that by now, I'm sure. All right, so this is a figure uh, that came out of Texas to basically show you um, how these hogs are coming off the landscape. And, and before we dive too deep in this, um, Texas has a, a, a different set of laws than we go by here. And one of the things they have in Texas, they do have uh, buying stations where you can bring live pigs in. Uh, they are inspected by USDA vet. Uh, after being inspected by a vet, they get processed uh, and they are exported out of the country and sold to other countries as a food product. Um, Texas, I believe, is the only state that is doing that right now, but that does happen in Texas. So I told you that because if we're looking at this figure, trap and sale, I knew I was gonna get a lot of questions about that. They're not talking about selling to individuals, they're talking about selling to these buying points. So they have established places where they can take hogs, a veterinarian inspects them to make sure they are safe for human consumption, um, and then they're, they're processed and, and put on a ship leaving the country, all right? Um, the other categories here, trap and destroy, trap and use, owner shoot, aerial shoot, hunting, dogging, snares. Um, they go through and list all of the things that they're doing. All right. I converted this slide, uh, this figure, to make it a little more applicable to what we're trying to discuss here tonight. So I took all of these numbers and I put them into this format. So basically, all these different trapping methods that you see listed on the right, I combined all of those into one category known as trapping. So if you look at the percentage of that hog harvest by technique, 59% of the hogs in this study were removed from trapping. 24% uh, of the hogs that they harvested that year came from sharpshooting, 11% of them came from hunting, and 6% came from dogging. The reason I'm spending the time here, when it is done properly, when it is done properly, Trapping will account for the largest number of hogs removed off the landscape year in, year out. Trapping's it. Not by itself. We're going to combine all these other techniques as well where we can fit them in. But trapping needs to be a major component if you are trying to get rid of hogs. All right. And I'm going to spend some time with you talking about trapping. But each and every one of these techniques is important. If it puts a dead pig on the ground, then we need to consider using it. And where it will fit, we need to apply it. So before we really get into these techniques, I wanted to mention some resources that are out there to help you out. Mississippi State's got a great publication out there, Wild Pig Management. Uh, it's just a practical methods. They go through anything you can think of to do with controlling pigs is mentioned in detail. There's trap designs, there, there's specific blueprints, everything you need uh, to get started in that. You can find information in that handout. Uh, USDA APHIS has another one out there, that, that picture on the right, uh, Managing Wild Pigs, is a very good publication. It's got a lot of good information in there. I think you would find that it has some pretty good trap diagrams as well to help you get started if you want to build your own. Uh, but 
those resources are available to you. Another resource, I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't mention this. Uh, I don't know how many of y'all are, are registered with Jaeger Pro, but if you're not, before you go to bed tonight, get on Jaeger Pro's website and, and register. Uh, Rod and those guys do a spectacular job of sending out routine newsletters with trapping techniques, how they're doing things, why they're doing things the way they're doing. And, you know, they, they include a lot of material that will make you a much better trapper. Even those of you who have a lot of experience, the guys at Jaeger Pro have got things for you to learn uh, and, and they make them readily available. You know, they wanna see you doing it right and they wanna see you doing a good job. Um, pay attention to some of those videos. You know, I've picked up quite a few things from them over the years and, and I know a lot of others have, but. Rod and those guys at Jaeger Pro are doing a really good job with putting educational materials out there to help all of us do a better job of managing pigs. Um, but again, he's got a great YouTube channel out there with a lot of videos. They send out uh, routine newsletters for you to take advantage of. Uh, they have a program, I, I, I hate to admit this, but I haven't watched it, but they have a good program on RFD TV. I talk to a lot of folks who, who watch it on a regular basis. I'm just not much of a TV person. Uh, if, if you do watch TV though, and, and you get RFD TV, they have a show that comes on, check the website, you can get the schedule for when that airs, but lots of good resources for you if you're wanting to improve your abilities. And, you know, as land managers, we're all, you know, we, we should be looking at ways to improve the things we do always. And then there's those shows out there that are purely for entertainment purposes. Now I'm not gonna lie, I have watched both of these shows quite a few times, but it, it's purely entertainment and I have never laughed so hard other than when I'm in the woods myself falling over stuff. But uh, don't think for a minute, either one of these shows uh, is teaching you anything about feral hog control because that's the furthest thing from the truth. This is strictly entertainment. The, the methods they use, the way they go about doing things, yeah, that ain't gonna help you at all. Uh, and to think that uh, watching these shows, they're out there doing this for somebody for a fee and spending three weeks out there to kill one or two pigs. I, I, I don't think many people would rehire them if that was the case. So it's a good thing A&E picked them up and helping them make a living off TV shows. All right, so let's talk about trapping in South Carolina. Let's dive into this. So I'm gonna make sure I go through for each technique what regulations are out there. Uh, Cause the last thing I wanna do is encourage you to break the law. I wanna make sure that we're doing things effectively but doing things within the law as well. Uh, so in South Carolina, you can trap year round on private land without the need for a hunting license or a permit. So to trap hogs, you don't have to have a hunting license. You don't have to have a trapping license. You don't have to have a trapping permit. That's the only technique that I'm going to tell you that about. But for trapping, no license is required. Uh, another one I get questions about a lot, snares. Snares are not legal in South Carolina for land sets. Uh, you cannot use them for land mammals. They are only allowed for beaver trapping in water sets. Um, so no snares uh, for hogs, that's, that's not legal. The other thing, a lot of people use box traps or cage traps. A lot of those traps are illegal. And, and the reason is specifically says in the law that the traps must allow a deer or bear to escape. Well, if the trap's got a top, bottom, and four sides, that's not leaving that animal a lot of opportunity to escape. Uh, so you, you may want to go modify those and take those tops out to give those animals an opportunity to get out. Um, keep that in mind, because I see a lot of those out there when I'm walking around. Uh, traps also have to have, and this is something that I very rarely see on hog traps that is supposed to be there. Traps must have a trapper identification tag. That's for all trapping in South Carolina, including hogs. So you have to have a tag on that trap that provides your name and your address. Or if you're worried about the general public or anybody that happened to be coming through that site, seeing who was actually trapping, instead of putting your name and address, you can put your South Carolina DNR customer ID. So if you have a hunting license, your customer ID will be on that license, or you can pull it up on their website and get it the tag can have just your customer ID. And that way, if somebody were to have an issue, DNR can determine who you are, but not just anybody can figure out who you are. Uh, so that's a, that's a little uh, security for you as well as a trapper, but make sure you have those trap tags out there uh, because it is, it is in the law that they have to be there. 
another thing, traps have got to be checked within 24 hours. So every 24 hours, that trap has to be checked. Um, another one that's interesting, and I don't know how much this one's enforced, uh, but a trapper must possess and have it on his person written permission to trap on that particular piece of property. So not written permission and I left it at home, written permission in my pocket while I'm out checking those traps. Um, so those are all just laws. I'm not here to enforce laws, but I am here to tell you what the laws are. Cause like I said, I don't want to see you get in trouble for trying to do the right thing, but maybe missing something. Here's what you need to do. So don't miss these things. Moving hogs. This has been a big issue especially, like I said, back in the, the, the 80s and 90s, pigs were getting moved all over the place and, and still to some extent today, but much more heavily happening back then. Uh, what does the law say in South Carolina? Um, let me see if I can move this. Whoop, I went the wrong way. Well, can't move that box. Anyway, you do have to have a permit if you intend to move any live hog from the wild in South Carolina. That permit is issued by DNR. The only place that you can move that pig is to a licensed permitted pig enclosure. There aren't many of those in this state. So essentially, with the exception of one or two counties, it's illegal to move a wild pig anywhere because if you don't have a permitted enclosure in your county, then you can't move that pig anywhere. It has to go to a permitted enclosure. And again, there's only a couple of those in the state. So only those counties are their tags from DNR for those pigs and tags for those enclosures. Uh, so any other situation, the only thing you can do is put that animal down when you catch it, or you can release it on the same property. So you could open the gate and turn it out. Why you would, I don't know, but I have no doubt in my mind, it does happen. Uh, I had a situation where I was trapping hogs and a gentleman that was on the property next door didn't really like the fact that I was getting rid of hogs. So he started trapping the hogs and then just turning them loose, uh, which kind of got them where they didn't want to walk into traps anymore. Imagine that. Uh, but it does happen. Um, I'm not going to read all this, take your time, go through it. But the gist of it, no, you can't catch one in the woods and bring it home and feed it out. No, that's illegal. You, you can't do it. Um, no, you can't catch one and move it five miles down the road to your hunting club and turn it loose. That's not legal. Uh, they can only be taken to permitted enclosures. And unless you're in one of the two or three counties that has one, then you can't move pigs. All right. Trapping is essential. We're never going to be able to manage pigs without the ability to trap. Trapping can become very, very difficult if folks are not doing it right. Hogs are extremely smart, extremely smart. In the grand scheme of things, I was reading something the other day. A wild pig will test higher on a cognitive test than a three-year-old human. In terms of intelligence in the animal community, the only animals smarter than a wild pig are chimpanzees, and that group, the dolphin family, and elephants. Other than that, they're, and humans, they're the smartest animals on the planet. You, you have to do things right. You know, I was telling somebody the other day, a deer runs into danger and he says, oh, I better run. A hog runs into danger and he says, oh, danger. What should I do to go around this? And how do I prevent this in the future? They think, they reason. Um, it, it's very difficult if people are trapping in the wrong way because hogs get smart. You know, we call them getting educated. Well, if you educate them, your success at trapping is going to go down big time. And not only is your success at trapping going to go down, your neighboring properties are going to experience the same things where you have messed up. So I'm going to spend some time on this trapping section because one, it's how we're going to remove most of the hogs each year. And two, it's critically important that we do it right or we don't do it at all, all right? Site selection, scent control, um, photo surveillance, lots and lots of things in there, pre-baiting, that's a big issue a lot of folks discuss. 
There's lots and lots of trap designs. I'm going to run through a bunch of that with you. Um, but I'm going to hit all these topics. And let's see if we can get through these. Photo surveillance. I, I, I say this every time I teach this class. And if you're listening and you've been in this class, then you know I'm telling you the truth. Photo surveillance is critical to successful trapping. If you are not using trail cameras to trap, please stop trapping. Don't trap. You have no business trapping pigs if you're not watching that site and that trap set with cameras. We only have success when we can remove entire sounders. All right. We have got to catch that whole group that we're after at one time. If one or two pigs are on the outside of that trap, when the door closes, you just educated one or two pigs. Go back to that worst case scenario. What happens if I left those one or two pigs out? Doesn't take long till I'm right back at the same number of hogs I was at before I caught some of that group. Not only that, I got educated pigs who will not go back in a trap and will also teach their offspring not to go in traps. It's critical that we watch these cameras, that we see how many hogs we're trying to catch, and that we don't set that trap until we have that whole group going into the trap, period. If you're not using these cameras, please stop trapping. You're making it harder on all of us. I don't like using a single camera. This is a good figure to kind of show the way I do things too. This one's from Mississippi State, but using multiple cameras so that I can get a good view of that corral trap and I can tell how many pigs are at that site. I have eliminated my blind spots. I can see, I can count, and I know not to send that text message to close that trap until uh, I've got all those pigs entering that site. So use multiple cameras, have a good idea of how those hogs are responding to that trap. And I'm gonna show you some pictures of that in a minute. Some things not to do. And, and these are all things that I've learned the hard way over the years. But these are really important. What not to do? Number one, when we're trapping, do not break the pattern. Don't break that pattern. If those hogs are coming the same way at the same time every day, you don't need to do anything to disturb those pigs until you set that trap off, all right? So if I'm trapping, I'm not gonna shoot a hog just because it runs across the road. I'm not gonna be out there dogging hogs if I'm trapping. I'm not gonna be sitting in deer stand shooting hogs when I'm trapping. I'm going to greatly limit my activity in that area because the last thing I want to do is break that pattern. I want to get that whole sounder. I don't want one or two out of the group. I want all of them. This is how you do it. Don't mess up. If we're trapping, we're trapping. We're not hunting. We're not dogging. We're not doing any of that. We're trapping. All right. I see this over and over again, putting a whole lot of feed on the outside of the trap to get the pigs used to the area. That's the worst thing you could do. Don't put corn on the outside of the trap. We're trying to get them in the trap and we want them all to go in together. If they get used to having food on the outside of that trap, a lot of them are going to run right into the trap while the rest of them mingle around on the outside and never go in. The food needs to be in the trap, not around the trap, in it. All right. I see this too. So if we're using tripwire traps, and I've done this myself in the past and learned the hard way. If you're using a tripwire or a root stick, um, don't put all of the feed on the trip wire or behind that root stick. You want to give those pigs time to get in the trap. So the majority of the food needs to be before you get to that root stick. And, and the idea, we want all the pigs to come in and start feeding, and we don't want anybody making it to that root stick until everybody's in the trap, all right? If you got all the food at the back, the very first pig that goes into the trap hits that root stick and closes the door while everybody's outside. Make sure the food is concentrated before you get to the root stick, and then you have a small amount on that trip wire root stick, all right? Don't stop feeding before you set the trap. I've seen this happen too, and you can break that pattern. Right now is a perfect example. If you got traps going right now, there's a good chance you can't get to them. It's too wet. You can't get down there. You can break the pattern if the food runs out. If the pattern breaks, well, there went that sounder. It's time to start over again. Uh, now, having said that, one thing I have done uh, over time that seems to work, pigs are greedy animals. 
you know, when I start getting them coming into that trap pretty regular, I'm going to start cutting back on how much food that I put into that trap. And the idea is because they're greedy animals, some of those that were lagging behind are going to come at a run to get into that trap. All right. So that's the idea with some of that gradual feeding reduction prior to setting that trap off is just to speed up how fast they go in. Here's a big oops. You remember we said that there has to be a way on your trap for deer or bear to get out. I don't know how many of y'all have ever caught a deer in a hog trap, but it can be rather exciting trying to get them out of there. Uh, depending on who you're trapping for, you might be in a whole lot of trouble if you, you know the landowner comes by and sees this sitting in the trap. Um, I don't like cage traps. We'll talk about that, but you'd need a way for those animals to get out if you were to get them in there. And you don't wanna have to get them out by hand because that's not good for you or the animals. Trust me on that. Same thing, I'm seeing a lot of these round traps and these cage traps out there. I understand the logic behind a round trap. It's real easy to roll it out there. It's real easy to roll it out there. One man can do it, they're effective. The downside, if I'm trying to catch a sounder that's got 20, 20 pigs in it, I doubt you're gonna fit all of them into this round trap or any of those little four by eight box traps, cage traps. You need to match that trap size to the number of animals you're trying to catch. Um, I, I realize the convenience factor with this, but you also got to realize the education factor with this. If you got 20 hogs coming into this trap and only four of them get in, 16 of them just learned about traps. You need to take that into consideration. The guillotine door traps have been around a long time. There's diagrams and those resources I showed you earlier. Just drop door traps. They work off of root sticks or trip wires, depending on how you set it up. Very, very effective traps. Um, but again, concentrate that food before you get to the trip wire or root stick. Give them time to get in there. When I set these traps, I got a screw when we used to use these guillotine doors. I'd take a screw and screw that sheet of plywood to that brace so that it couldn't fall down. I'd let those pigs feed there as long as they needed to until on that camera, everybody was going into that trap at the exact same time. And at that point, I would come back and actually set that trap. Again, Jaeger Pro's got a good trap that's on the market. The mine system is, is one of these tech traps where it works off of cell phone communication, or you can set it to do it with a trip wire, either one. Uh, I'm sure y'all are all familiar with them. Very, very effective tools, very effective tools. Uh, there have been tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pigs removed from the Southeast in the past five years with these traps, definitely in the hundred thousand. Uh, a lot of traps are leaving the landscape, or a lot of pigs are leaving the landscape because of these traps. Um, very effective. I've used them. They work well. They're a little pricey. Yeah, good ain't cheap and cheap ain't good. I don't know what to tell you. Um, but they are good systems. They work well. I don't use them much anymore because when I did have four or five of them running, uh, people like to pick up your gates and walk off with them and it gets expensive when these things start disappearing. The boar buster traps on the market, a lot of y'all seen this. It kind of was developed based off of uh, drop nets that were being used in Texas uh, for deer and they noticed they could catch pigs in them too. So this kind of follows the drop net principle. So the entire trap is up off the ground so the pigs can see all the way under it. Uh, the mindset is that with the pigs being able to see all the way under the trap, they're not as reluctant to walk into it. Um, and, and that probably is true. Um, it, it's a very effective trap. Um, the, the biggest downside I have with the boar buster trap is the size and weight. Um, I'm not that tough of a guy. I can't pick this thing up, move it around and set it by myself. I doubt any of y'all can either. Uh, th this is a multi-person task to set this thing up and it's only going to work in areas where it will fit uh, with the vehicle and trailer to get it in there. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Very effective though. I'm not, I'm not knocking it on quality. It, for me, it's a weight issue and an ability to put it in different locations. Uh, but the, the trap itself works very well if you've got the right conditions for it. Uh, back in the day, the old slammer doors were really popular. Saw a lot of them built into uh, cage traps back in the day. A lot of people still use them. Uh, very effective. It's a spring system that works off of a root stick or a trip wire, either one, however you want to do it. 
but it, it spring closes itself. A lot of pigs taken out over the day. One of the things I'll go back to, notice how wide that gate is. Notice how open that is. You know, they got plenty of area to walk in. The Jaeger Pro traps, what, eight or 10 foot wide, 10 foot, I think. No, I think it's eight foot. The wider that entry, the less reluctance you're gonna have to get that animal to walk in. So the smaller the entry, the more reluctant they are to go in, the wider the entry, uh, the more readily they'll enter. This is another trap design that we've done a good bit with in South Carolina where you don't use a gate. It's basically a funnel entry. So this trap's built to look like a figure six or a figure nine. Uh, and the pigs come in and let's see if I can find my cursor. Here we go, maybe. Nope, disappeared again. Anyway, the pigs walk in, they hit this, this uh, long side on the six and they follow that long side because we had baited there originally when we were training them. Those pigs will walk in and we've got it fully open now where a pig can just walk in there and eat all he wants to. And we will do this, leave it pulled open for the whole time we're pre-baiting. And when our cameras show us that all the pigs in that sounder are going in that trap to feed, then we'll take that panel where you see that orange cable on the right hand or on the left hand picture, you'll see that orange strap. We will take that and pull that piece of panel back to the left, like you see in the picture on the right. And then we'll use bungee cords to secure it. Then when the pigs come in that evening, they will push their way in, but they can't push their way back out. Uh, and this trap is, is very effective and you don't have the expense of a gate. Uh, a friend of mine, Katie, was having trouble getting pigs trapped. So we came in and set one of these up or, and, and got her the, the, the methods for how we were doing things. And she set it up and she had a lot of success using it. It worked out very well for her. Um, and, and catching a lot of pigs with the same location as new groups moved in, she would start baiting again. She would get that group using that trap. She would take that entire group out with that trap in one setting. Then she would open the trap back up. Once pigs start using the area again, you put more bait out, you start conditioning them to feed in that trap site. Once you got that sounder using that trap site, go back and set the trap again. You can knock out the whole sounder that way. And then, you know, over time, new pigs are most likely gonna move into the area. Start back over. Uh, it's a continual process. Uh, you're never finished with hog management. If you got hogs, more than likely, you're gonna be working on hogs from now till eternity. Uh, but you have to stay with it because if we don't take them out, we will see the population explosion. This is a new one that's on the market uh, and I, I'm really interested in this trap and basically fascinated with it. It's a completely new concept um, that is very different than anything you've seen before, but the pig brig uh, was, was put through the, the test runs here in South Carolina uh, a good friend of mine in Fairfield County did a lot of work with this trap over the past two years. And this is a very good new system that's out there. I'm not telling you it's better than anything else, but in management, new tools are always appreciated. This is a new tool. Uh, this is a net trap that we pull the bottom open during the pre-bait session. So much like the boar buster, it's completely open. They can walk in and feed all they want to. When we get ready to set it, we lower that net back down, like you see in the picture on the left. And then using the system of, of cords and stakes, we stake that bottom down. Uh, and then if you look on the right, you'll notice those pigs actually root up under that net that's laying on the ground and they get in there to eat. But instead of rooting their way back out, they go straight to the sides trying to get out and it won't pull loose to let them out. This is a new system, so there's a lot left to learn, but it's a very effective system. The thing I like most about it is it's super lightweight. We're talking 20, 30 pounds. I can set it with T-post or I can set it off trees in the woods. It's easy to move this into remote areas where we can't get to with other traps. For that reason, I like it. Being patient. We gotta be patient if we're gonna control hogs. There's no doubt about it. You gotta be patient. In this particular situation, I was trapping a group of pigs and a handful of these animals did not want to go in a trap. Over the course of a couple of weeks, we were able to condition them, um, but you got to be patient for those weeks. And I know it's not easy when you're getting text messages at 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3 in the morning, 
about pigs coming to these traps and three or four of them are not going in. I, I understand it takes patience to deal with that, but we have to. We're not going to set this trap. And, you know, I, I, I laugh. If any of y'all have seen this yet, you understand why I'm laughing. But there's, there's a lot of times where there's going to be that one pig who is educated and she just will not go in that trap. That happens. I would encourage you to give it a few more days and try to get her to go in there with that group. But if you can't get her going in the trap with the group, when you get everybody else in that trap, close the trap and shoot her. And in these situations, I think you'll find that you're much more effective if you can sit there that night when that trap closes, be ready to pull the trigger because she's going to be there right there with them. And as soon as that trap closes, go ahead and shoot her. That should take care of that sounder. Um, but again, there are pigs that are trap shy and will not go in a trap. That is very much real. But if you're patient and you wait, most of the time you will get them all in the trap. And now it's time to send that text message and shut her down uh, and take care of that situation. Not all pigs are created equal. Um, it, this is not common, but it does happen. You know, out of the thousand pigs I've looked at in traps or more than that, whatever it's been over the years, nine times out of 10, they run around in circles and ram off the sides. They run straight into the side of that trap over and over and over, just bouncing off it like ping pong balls. Every once in a while, you're gonna find a smart pig like this boar who would come in the trap, get caught, and then climb out of the fence like you or I would. He'd get his head over that thing and then he'd take his back feet into the wire and over the fence he goes. The next night he'd come in, set the trap off and over the fence he goes. There are pigs that know how to get out of traps. Simple as that. This particular boar was one of them. In that situation, not a bad idea to be sitting there waiting on him to just take care of that with the rifle. All right, let's talk about night hunting. Um, and I know I got a lot left to go and not a lot of time, so I'm gonna try to hurry up through this, but the regulations in South Carolina, if you wanna shoot pigs at night, uh, the property has to be registered with DNR and you can do that on their website, but the property has to be registered with DNR each year and it is defined by calendar year. So it's January 1st to December 31st. You have to re-register that property every year in accordance with those dates. Once you have that property registered, uh, you can hunt hogs at night. Um, there's no, uh, no limits to the firearms that you can use. Uh, you, you can use night vision, thermal imaging, spotlights, any of those things that you would like to use are legal. Um, you, you don't need to uh, shoot across roads or be too close to houses. Read the, read the laws there, make sure you're within that. Unlike trapping, if you are night shooting hogs, you are required to have a license, a hunting license, if you're over 16 years of age. So that's, that's a big difference there. The technology has come so far in the past 20 years. You know, we have stuff now that is military grade, very, very effective night vision very good quality thermal imaging that is available for us. There's a lot of options out there. Uh, I will say this one more time, when it comes to these technologies, cheap ain't good and good ain't cheap. You're gonna pay for a quality piece of glass. You're gonna pay for a quality night vision scope. You're gonna pay for a quality thermal imaging scope. It's money well spent. It's money well spent. Um, how effective are we with night shooting? We can be very effective with it if you know how to do it but it's not effective year round. Uh, when is night shooting really effective? When we're planting corn or peanuts is a great time uh, to take up night, night shooting. Uh, real early emergence on some of these crops is a good time. Once our ag crops get up tall, very limited success. We just can't see the pigs anymore. Uh, a lot of the, the bottomland areas are so vegetated during the growing season that we can't see to do it during then. Um, when we have limited vegetation, night shooting is very effective. Um, in my experience, you can do this lots of ways. You can sit and wait on the pigs to come to you. Uh, you, you can try spotting and stalking the pigs when you see them. And then that's what you're gonna do regardless uh, in most situations is you're gonna have to make that stalk to get close enough to take that whole group out before they leave the field. Um, but the, the most effective way to do this is traveling from field to field. Find the pigs in the field at night, put a stalk on, take out as many of them as you can move to the next field and then to the next one and just repeat and repeat and repeat that that's how you take down a lot of numbers in a short amount of time sitting and waiting uh, i'm not a big fan of that but moving from field to field you can do a pretty good job this way 
Um, again, lots and lots of options out there. A lot of, a lot of different firearms that are, are used today. You, you'll notice that a lot of the AR platforms are, are becoming more and more hog minded. Uh, a lot of the bolt action rifles are becoming more and more hog minded. You, you will see that firearms are changing to meet the demands of, of hog managers. Uh, and, and for the good, you know, we're getting some pretty good quality products out there now, not just the firearms, but the optics as well. Um, again, the best way to do this is moving field to field or bottom to bottom, find the pigs, put on a stalk, take out as many as you can, move on to the next spot, do the same thing. I really want y'all who are night hunting to be very, very careful. Um, throughout the South, there's been accident after accident reported with night hunting. We have had one fatality in South Carolina a few years ago. Um, be careful with what you're doing. Know what's beyond your target. Uh, know, if, very importantly, know if other people are on that property. Uh, you know, and in some of these situations, that has been the main cause of these, these fatalities is people just didn't know the other people were there. Uh, so make sure you know what's going on. This needs to be a coordinated event, not something you just run out at the spur of the moment and do. You need to coordinate with everybody, make sure everybody that has permission to be on those properties know when you're there and where you're at. Uh, and the same thing for them. If they're going to be on the property, you need to know when they're going to be there and where they're at. Uh, so do your due, due, due diligence and, and understand that uh, and be safe out there. Steel hunting, uh, again, we're our deer hunters are taking about 30,000 pigs a year. So uh, we're gonna discuss those regulations a little bit. In South Carolina, you do have to have a hunting license to still hunt pigs. On private land, there's no closed season. Uh, if you're gonna shoot at night, remember you gotta register that property. Uh, you can legally hunt over bait. You can legally use electronic calls. Um, as long as it's a legal firearm in South Carolina, it is acceptable for use. So bows, arrows, crossbows, all that stuff. <laughs> I know folks are trying to do a lot of this stand hunting and that, that can be somewhat effective, but you're typically gonna be limited to one or two pigs when you're stand hunting versus some of these spot and stalk deals where you might take out five or 10. Um, the biggest thing for either one, hogs can smell better than a dog. Make sure you're working the wind properly. If you think deer bust you with their nose, hogs are worse. Uh, make sure you got the wind in your favor. Uh, and, and another important thing, we've talked about pattern and the pigs, getting them on a pattern, knowing what they're doing. They're doing you the same way. They pattern you just like you pattern them. They know if you're coming to the same stand over and over, they know that, they avoid it. They know to move and check the wind before they come in that area. They know to move and see if you're actually there. Uh, so hunting the same spot over and over and over will greatly diminish the number of pigs you're seeing in that spot. You need to rotate those stands only hunt them when the wind is right for you to be in that stand uh, and try to do it the right way so you're more effective. Hog dogging uh, is nothing new. Hog dogging has been around ever since pigs showed up here. You know, a lot of these were old range hogs that farmers had and they'd use dogs to go round them up and take to the market. Uh, people are still doing it to this day. It is allowed year round on private property. If you're dogging at night, that property has to be registered for night hunt property. Uh, and if you're dog hunting, you have to possess a valid hunting license. Um, there are different seasons. I know we had a bunch of questions about WNAs and all that. I'm not gonna dive into that, but there are WMA seasons. Uh, should they be open year round? Should they not? That's not for me to decide. I wish they were open year round because I'd have more opportunities uh, just like a lot of you would. Uh, but for the time being, they have established dates that you can be on those WMAs. Uh, they're published every year in that um, regulation book. So go check it out. The big thing with dogging, it requires cooperation between landowners. I don't care how big a track of land you have. You're not going to keep those dogs on that track of land if the pig decides to run off that track of land. You know, I've, I've had tracks that were 10,000 plus acres and within 15 minutes of turning out, I'm already got dogs off the property. That's how it works. You know, that's out of your control. What you need to do is before you start hunting these areas, work with the landowners around there and get everybody on board with what you're doing. And, and, and that way you don't run into these scenarios. Um, hog dogging is very effective when food resources are plentiful, when uh, trapping's not working very well because food's everywhere. 
uh, night shooting is not working very well because the vegetation is too tall. Great opportunities to come in and knock pigs out with hog dogs. Uh, it is a great tool for that. And unlike the other management techniques, dogging actually makes those hogs move out of an area. It ain't permanent, but pressure from dogs will push them off of that property. Uh, maybe for a day, maybe for months, maybe for much more than a month. Um, one of the things that we've done over the years is try to rotate property so we're not dogging the exact same property every week. Uh, and basically what we do is try to push them off of one property onto the next, then we hit that property and we're just trying to make a circle and keep those hogs so we're picking them away every week. Uh, but you will run them off of properties with dogs. Uh, another thing I put in there, you know, I hear people all the time about guns. We've been doing this, I don't know, 20 some years now. We don't carry guns. Uh, I don't think it's necessary when you're dogging hogs. In fact, I think it's dangerous and uh, I don't recommend it personally. Uh, I'm not telling you if you got a safe group that knows where everybody's at, they can't safely do it because they can. You know, if everybody's together and coordinated, it can be done safely. But in most situations, I feel like it's an unnecessary danger. Um, some of you may or may not remember this, but uh, my old college uh, office mate was accidentally shot in Wahala years ago, hog hunting, and, and he didn't make it. Uh, someone was apparently at the bay and, and, and may or may not have shot at bushes. I don't know the full story because I wasn't standing there, but a bad shot was taken and a young man lost his life while hunting hogs with dogs. When those dogs bay a hog up, it's a pretty adrenaline packed moment and not everyone thinks very clearly when adrenaline is rushing. I'd hate to see another one of these situations occur. So I, I'm gonna highly recommend that when you are hog dogging, you don't really need, you don't need guns. Dogs will take care of it. Lots of different techniques for using dogs. Um, of course, you got dogs that go out and find the pigs for you. Those are called bay dogs generally. Uh, some of them you just dump out on a trail and they work that trail till they find the pig. Uh, some of us hunt walking dogs where we literally walk through and let the dogs walk with us. It's kind of like bird hunting and then they pick up the hogs and we go from there. Uh, some people do free cast dogs where they just dump them out and let them go do their thing until they find the hogs on their own. Uh, lots of different ways to do it there. Uh, there are dogs that are used with night vision where we're riding around with night vision, spot the hogs in the field and those dogs will run out and catch those, those pigs in the field before they get out. Um, different dogs to hold pigs once the bay dogs bay them up. Um, typically it's done with bulldogs, but I've seen a few other breeds that were used. Um, but dogging hogs can be very effective. It can be very effective. And lots of hogs in South Carolina are removed every year from hog dogging. Aerial gunning, you know, you see this out in Texas and it's super effective in Texas, but Texas ain't South Carolina. Uh, in South Carolina, it's effective in the salt marshes. And that's pretty much it. Anywhere else, our vegetation's way too dense and it's only, you know, a quick sprint and that hog's in a woodlot somewhere or in a swamp somewhere. Um, aerial gunning's effective in open lands. If you don't have fully open lands, it's not very effective. Uh, so in South Carolina, it's pretty much only been used on the, on the coast and along those salt marshes and some of those barrier islands. Judas pigs. Uh, you know, Judas pigs used to be used a lot. They're not used anymore. More people are doing it now though, because technology is more available. Judas pigs, basically we go catch a young sow, whether in a trap or with the dogs, you put a tracking device around it and you turn that young sow loose. And like I told you earlier, young sows are very social. Sows in general are social. They don't like to be alone. So when you turn her loose, she's gonna go find another group of pigs. Then you check your tracking device and you track back to where she's at and shoot everybody that jumps up with her. It's fairly effective. Um, it's, it's not as common as it used to be, I don't think, but once upon a time, this was a, you know, considered a pretty important management technique. But again, technology is more and more available, so people are, are starting to consider doing this more now. I'm not telling you to do it. I, I, I think there's better ways to do it, but this is a technique, and you got to consider all the tools in the toolbox. Toxicants. Currently, we have no legal toxicants in South Carolina. Uh, we will have some in the future. They are being researched, they're being developed. Everything we need is going right along. It's just a matter of time to get everything together so that we can have toxicants available. Currently, there are people that keep discussing all these home brew remedies they're doing. I would stop. 
discussing that if I was you. Uh, it's a violation of federal law to use a product inconsistent with its label. And it can come with federal prison time. I, I would take that very seriously. And there is an illegal toxicant. So if you have a toxicant out, you're in violation of federal law. You don't want to be there when someone discovers that, trust me. But until we get one approved in South Carolina, we still got you know, we, we still got high speed, hot copper plated lead. You know, we, we can put some lead in them and lead poisoning is pretty fatal. Um, so until we get the toxin, don't use stuff that's not labeled. Don't, don't do that. Um, stick with the guns and the traps and the dogs. We'll get a toxin. If a lot of people are doing the wrong thing and breaking federal laws, it's gonna make it harder for us to get that toxin. When we do get a toxin, make sure you follow the directions because the last thing we want to do is have environmental issues and then lose the ability to have that product all right kaput is one that came on the market but got pulled rel relatively quick because we didn't feel as scientists that they had enough data to back up the product um, they are in the process of gathering that science right now um, and I, I have a, a colleague down at savannah riverside who's done some studies with kaput it's a warfarin based toxicant Warfarin as in rodenticide, warfarin as in uh, blood thinner. In the pen trials, so captive pigs, this product worked very well. In the wild, it did not work very well. We couldn't get them to consume enough of this product to actually kill them. So they're working on formulas right now to make the hogs more readily consume the product so they can take a lethal dose in a shorter amount of time. The way the product was originally built, it had a blue marker in it. As you can see in that hog picture, that blue fat, if the hog had consumed kaput, that product would dye the fat in that pig so that you would know not to eat that animal. It was contaminated with poison. I would anticipate as the research moves further along with this product, you're gonna see something very similar to that stick around for safety reasons. But again, this product is not labeled for use in South Carolina at this time. All right. Sodium nitrite has the same story. Sodium nitrite is a very, very effective toxicant for pigs. Uh, it's a meat preservative. You all know it from preserving sausages and bacons. Uh, but when eaten in high doses in a small amount of time, it is lethal to pigs. Uh, it basically makes them suffocate. They're not able to uh, take in enough oxygen into the blood because they're limited on oxygen, they die. Uh, this product is not on the market yet. There are trials underway right now. The problem is pigs don't like sodium nitrite. And so far there hasn't been an ingredient mixed with it uh, that would really allow us to get enough of those pigs to consume a lethal dose. Uh, but it is under review right now. It is being researched. Eventually we will have a toxicant or maybe two or three toxicants. So the day is coming, you gotta be patient, it'll get there. Exclusion, I know a lot of the farmers don't like to hear me say this, but if you're farming and you got pig problems, then you can justify a fence. If you can't justify a fence, then you don't have pig problems. And we gotta keep this in consideration. I know a lot of farmers who I deal with every year that have pig problems. Some of them have spent fifteen, twenty thousand dollars on rifles and night vision scopes. Another five to ten thousand dollars on traps. I'm not telling you that trapping and night shooting aren't important, but I will not guarantee protection of your crop from trapping, night shooting, or dogging. Put a fence on that crop, and we can guarantee protection. When you get down to the brass tacks on this thing. A lot of folks are spending more money on guns and traps than it would have cost them to fence in those ag fields to start with and stop this damage from happening. Think about this. If you're farming and pigs are a problem, I, look, I know how aggravating it is to have to open a gate to go in to farm. I get it. I get it. Nobody wants to have to get off the tractor and go open the gates. If it saves my crop, I'm going to get off the tractor and go open the gate. All right. We're not talking big elaborate fences. You know, we've demonstrated this on Clemson's research facilities where we had hog problems. A very simple two strand electric fence will keep hogs out of that crop. Simple, 
cheap, easy to run, and it works. This is one they were using to keep the pigs from rooting up all the irrigation down in Texas. They were getting into the orchards, rooting up the irrigation lines. They had great success with theirs. We are talking about two hot wires, one six to eight inches off the ground and one 12 to 14 inches off the ground. Two wires, that's it. Now that hog will test that fence on a regular basis, um, but it works. As long as that power's going through there, hogs don't like electricity, and you'll find that this will protect that crop. Uh, some of the pasture land, I've, I've talked to some folks, and, and what we're doing on some of the pasture sites is coming back in on those high tensile fences and including an additional wire lower down. So we're gonna put a wire six to eight inches off the ground in conjunction with that fence. So having a wire six to eight inches off the ground and a wire you know, 12 to 14 inches off the ground, we're gonna stop those hogs from coming into that cow pasture. Lots and lots of materials out there. You can build it, you know, and this is just a rough estimate, but for a two wire electric fence, with a H brace every 100 foot, we're talking about 85 cent a foot to put this fence up, all right? If we put up a woven wire fence, which is gonna keep hogs out if you do it right, you put up a woven wire fence, you're between 90 and $1.20 a foot, somewhere in there, all right? I realize you're gonna have to open gates and I realize you're gonna have to maintain the fence, but it will stop the problems in those, in those fields. Habitat modification. Hogs sleep in the thickest, nastiest stuff they can find. And if you've got an ag field that is adjacent to the thickest, nastiest stuff you can find, well, hogs aren't having to move a whole lot. They're sleeping in that thick stuff and then they're walking into your field. In some situations, I would encourage you to come in and clean those areas up to make it less enticing for them. I don't wanna see this done wide scale because that's valuable habitat for a lot of other wildlife species, but immediately adjacent to some high damage row crop fields, I think you can justify it there. Uh, just some examples of that, but but pigs like thick cover, and uh, in the absence of thick cover, it, it kind of encourages them to move along to somewhere that's a little better suited for them. Putting all this trapping and, and shooting and, and dogging and, and all of these things together, what does it look like? We need to be trapping when food sources are limited and the pigs aren't wary, you know. Once those food resources are not limited, uh, maybe we can look at night shooting. You know, they're coming into these freshly planted fields. Uh, so when we're planting and we're harvesting, that's a good time to start shooting at night. When food is plentiful, the vegetation's tall and you can't use night vision and we have stopped trapping, it might be a good opportunity if you have a big enough piece of land to start hog dogging. Um, along with that, if you got food plots or row crop fields or pastures that are being damaged, install, maintain, and monitor exclusion fences on those areas. Eliminate deer feeding. You know, we're putting out a tremendous amount of corn in this state to feed deer. And the reality is we're feeding a lot of pigs too. If you've ever tried to trap hogs, it works best when you're the only food source around. If there's deer corn everywhere year round, which is what we're seeing today. It's really hard to be that only food resource if everybody's got corn piles out. Um, I'm not gonna tell you not to do corn piles, but I wanna discuss something with you on that topic in just a second. But if you're managing property and you're inclined, stopping the feeding of deer corn on that property will help you out a lot with that pig population. When we get toxicants available, if they fit into your management plan, incorporate them into the plan. I think you will find they'll be a valuable tool. They're not a silver bullet. You know, we've already got products on different continents. Australia's got toxicants that have been tested and used for years. And guess what? They still got pig problems. It doesn't matter what toxicant we get. It's not gonna solve our pig problem. It's gonna be a tool in the toolbox. that helps us harvest the pigs we need to harvest each year to keep that population either stable or declining. Um, so. Don't misuse these products when they do become available because it's really difficult to get a mammal toxicant to be put out into the wild settings. Use them appropriately so that we have them around for a while once we get them. Food quality, I know there's a lot of questions about this. The, the big thing, when you are dressing these animals, you need to wear uh, gloves, rubber gloves, latex gloves, nitrile gloves, whatever. 
Um, but there are uh, zoonotic diseases that you can get from uh, feral pigs. You're most likely to get exposed uh, to swine brucellosis uh, when you're field dressing that animal. Uh, you're, you'll find most of that bacteria is in that reproductive uh, tract. Uh, so when you're field dressing, when you're skinning, uh, when you're processing, whatever you're doing, I would encourage you to wear uh, protective gloves. Typically, uh, what you'll see are feral pigs are extremely lean. There's not a lot of fat on them. Uh, in this particular uh, animal, this was a pregnant sow, which is typically gonna be the fattest pigs that you catch. Uh, pregnant sows may have a couple inches of fat around them. It really boosts the flavor. They're good on the grill. They're good on the barbecue. Um, I eat a lot of wild pig. Um, you need to make sure it's thoroughly cooked. Make sure you're going to 160 degrees. That should take care of any parasite or disease issues we have. Make sure it's well done. Simple as that. Wear your gloves when you're processing. Make sure you get it well done. Um, you know, I get people that ask me all the time about eating them. My rule is if I can smell him walking in, he ain't going on my dinner table. And by that, I mean, if you've ever been around a big boar hog, it'll make your eyes water. Uh, he stinks so bad. You don't want to try to cook that in the house. All right. Simple as that. Younger pigs, you know, those 60 to 80 pounders are wonderful. Um, they, they make great meals. Pregnant sows, big sows with a little bit of fat on them, they make good table fare. Um, so, yeah. And, and it, like I said, in Texas, they're selling them to foreign countries and they're getting above domestic hog prices for them because they're a delicacy in other countries. And they're our pigs, you know. So don't think you can't eat them. If they're eating them over there, you can eat them. Be careful. Wear your gloves. Cook it well done. You should be fine. I'm almost finished, but there's a few things I wanted to mention. We have some problems that I would like to see changed. And one of those things is we're catching hogs out there that have been castrated and ear notched and turned back loose. Stop doing that. There's no reason for you to be turning hogs back loose. If you catch the hog, kill it. There's gonna be plenty more to take its place. The whole concept behind this is you're going to grow a fatter hog that's better to eat. And since it's castrated, he's not going to fight. So his tusks are going to be longer. Give me a break. Give me a break. There's no sense in that. If you catch him, go ahead and put the dang thing down. This is something that needs to happen throughout this state. And I would really like to see some legislation on this. If you're going to feed deer on your property and you got pigs, you need to put up an enclosure that only the deer can get into, not the pigs. You can do this with hog panels, cattle panels, horse panels, it doesn't matter. Build a, an enclosure, put the feeder in the enclosure or the corn pile in the enclosure. The deer will jump right in there and feed, the pig can't do that, all right? That way we're not giving them all the corn they want. It'll help us out a lot. I would really like to see if any of y'all have any input into legislation, this needs to happen. We need some, some more improved legislation on moving hogs. We need the ability to write substantial fines that can be upheld in a court of law when people try to move hogs around. We've got to stop that. There's hogs all over this state at this point. There's no point in anybody moving a pig anywhere. Uh, and we need, we need some pretty hefty fines for this. And that's being discussed and worked on as we speak. I don't know where it'll get to, uh, but I would like to see some changes there. The big one, whether we're talking about your property or the state of South Carolina, we have got to stop looking at these things at a small level. We've got to look at management of hogs on a bigger scale. I told you earlier, there's not a mountain range in the South that a hog can't climb. There's not a river they can't swim and there's not a lake they can't cross. Everybody in the South that's battling this is gonna to have to work together and get on the same page with legislation regarding hogs and the same page with management of these hogs. If we're all working towards the same goal, we may get there. If we're not, then it ain't gonna happen. And we can dump all the money we want to into eradicating hogs in one state. If you don't get rid of the hogs in the state next door, they're just gonna swim the river and come right back. Simple as that. Uh, we need to be working together at a regional level to address these problems. Whether that's the region of Hampton County, the, the region of the Savannah River Valley, you know, or, or the Southeast, but it's gotta be bigger than a single property. 